If you have your Bibles today, would you join me in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4. 1 Peter, chapter number 4. Begin reading today in verse number 12. Again, while you're turning, let me thank you for being here and let me welcome you in to the service today. It's a delight to see all of you. It's a joy to see you. It's an honor to see you here in the service today. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing, as unto a faithful Creator. One of the most difficult questions that's ever posed to a pastor is this question. Pastor, why? Standing by the bedside of a parent or parents whose child in the very bloom of life has been taken from them, why would God do this? A middle-aged person struck down early, why would God do this? Peter answers that question to some degree in these passages of Scripture. And the question that I want to try to help us with today is why do good people suffer? You know of people that suffer. You, you've probably yourself suffered somewhat down the journey of life. But in order to answer the question, I think it's important that we understand the setting of this letter. Of course, this letter was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Nero had taken the life of the Apostle Paul. And eventually, he would be responsible for a great persecution against Christians. Here was a man who was obsessed with building programs. And in order to find more ground to build more buildings upon, he torched the city of Rome. And as the city began to burn and people began to lose their personal possessions, and as people began to lose their lives in the fire, word spread like the fire that it was Nero who indeed had set the city on fire. And the people started a revolt against him. And in order to shift the blame from himself, he started a rumor that it was not he that set the city on fire, but in fact, it was those people who called themselves Christians. That it was the Christians who set the city on fire, that they, are, they have lost their homes, their, their possessions, their personal property because of the Christians. And the end results of that was a severe persecution. 
began to break out against the Christians. They gave their lives. They were severely persecuted because of Nero. If you look back at the first chapter of the book of 1 Peter, if you'll notice, he's writing this letter in verse number 1 to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And the reason they are scattered is because of persecution. The word scattered there was the word that was used for sowing seed, scattering seed out in the field. And like a person would sow seed and scatter seed in the field, so the Christians were being scattered to these different areas because of the intense persecution brought to bear upon them because of the rumors of Nero. Therefore, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter writes this letter. And he talks to these people about the sufferings of Christians. And he talks about how to handle the sufferings as sufferings come upon the Christian. Some 15 times in this letter, he refers to the sufferings of Christians. He uses some uh, eight different words to describe the different kinds of sufferings that that Christians endure. You see, we're all aware of the reality of suffering. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you have a lot or if you have nothing. It doesn't matter if you're known, well known or not known at all. It doesn't matter on which side of the tracks you live. It doesn't matter whether it's a known city or an unknown city. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter what the pedigree is. The truth of the matter is suffering is a part of life. Job 14.1 says that man that's born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, there are different kinds of suffering. We experience different kinds of suffering. Some of the sufferings that we experience are natural sufferings. Some of the sufferings that we experience are sufferings that we bring upon ourselves. And some of the sufferings that we experience are sufferings that God allows to come upon the life of a Christian for some specified reason that we will look at here in just a few moments. But first of all, there's just the natural sufferings that we have to endure just because we live here on planet Earth. Just as sure as you're born on this earth, there will be times of suffering. It comes with our birth. When man disobeyed God back in the garden, he brought sin upon the human race. And the results of sin upon the human race is suffering and death, and perplexity. There in the garden, they begin immediately to suffer because of their sins. The first thing that God did, He drove them out. He sent flaming cherubims there to keep them from entering back into the garden and partake of the tree of life and live on forever in their sin. It's just a matter of time until one of their children takes the life of another child born to Adam and Eve, suffering continued and suffering commenced. And as you go through the Old Testament Scriptures, you will find times untold where there's suffering. It's very interesting, and I thought about this this morning. I challenge you to turn back for just a moment to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, in this great Hebrews Hall of Fame. (laughs) It's amazing how he references the sufferings of the saints. Notice Hebrews 11, the Bible says in verse number 36, and others. Now don't miss that phrase, and others. Because just previous to this, he's been talking about a great host of heroes who had faith to escape sufferings brought upon them. But now he changes the terminology in verse number 36, and he's talking about others. And all those, although those previous suffered, 
they were not called upon to suffer to the same degree as these that he is now about to describe. Because in verse 36, and he said, others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. So previously, God gave faith to escape. But here God gives faith to endure the sufferings. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about this era in time in our history when they would actually take hollow logs and they would put Christians inside of those hollow logs. And then they would take a saw and they would cut the log in two and kill those Christians. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. There's a group of people that suffered. So suffering is a common thing to people that live on planet Earth. Today people can be well and tomorrow they can suffer. Today people can be about church and, and uh, fellowship on Sunday afternoon, and tomorrow they can be about their job. Next week this time they can be in intensive care in severe pain. It is the common lot of humanity to suffer. Many times I've had people to say to me, why? Why didn't God intervene? Why did God allow this to happen? And I have to remind people that we're living in a fallen world where Sin is taking its course because that was the course that our forefathers chose to take. And they passed it to their children and from that generation to the next generation and down to this generation. And we are inheritors of the curse. And the curse of sin brings suffering upon the human race. It's all because of sin. But then there is suffering that's brought upon us by things that we may do. Notice in your Bibles, please, in verse 15 of 1 Peter chapter 4, the Bible says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Sometimes people suffer because of the sin they choose to commit. Sometimes our suffering is brought upon us by the things that we choose to do. The writer here says, now let's get something straight. There are some areas where you can prevent suffering from happening in your life. He said, don't take a person's life. Don't suffer. Don't suffer. Notice what he said. Let none of you suffer as a murderer. What's the end result of that? Well, the end result of that is, according to the laws of the land, man takes another person's life. They must suffer for that. Now he said, look, you're Christians. Don't suffer as a murderer. Don't suffer as a thief. Don't go out and take something from someone that doesn't belong to you rightfully and have to pay the piper, have to pay the cost in court have to pay the cost in jail somewhere because of something dumb and stupid and idiotic that you chose to do. A person that takes another person's life has to suffer for it. A person that goes out and takes something that doesn't belong to them has to suffer for that. Notice he said, not only that, but an evildoer. Someone that lives to do evil. Someone that lives to be around the wrong crowd. The crowd that's always doing that which is evil, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Now, that's a very interesting word. That means somebody that oversees uh, another person's things. In other words, baby translation, you don't get in trouble if you keep your nose out of other people's business. That's what he's saying. Uh, don't be a busybody. Because by so doing, he's saying... You can suffer for that. Now, look, we've got to suffer enough in this world without going out and robbing a grocery store. You've got to suffer enough in this world without going out and taking someone's life. 
It's amazing when people do those stupid things. They think they are relieving themselves of some type of anger in their heart, but by the time they get to the courtroom and stand in front of the judge, they've had a complete change of heart and a change of mind, albeit it's too late now for that. So he's saying we bring things upon ourselves. Galatians chapter 4, uh, excuse me, chapter 6, verse number 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. A man goes out and gets drunk, drives his car down the road at a high rate of speed, loses control, hits someone else, or turns the automobile over, ends up in intensive care somewhere. He has brought upon himself a misery that he should not have to experience simply because he did something dumb and stupid. A man goes out and gets on drugs and, and gets high and ends up in intensive care somewhere and has to pay the consequences of that. These are things that people choose to do to themselves that brings about additional suffering that they should not have to endure simply because they did that which was wrong and the end results of that was they brought misery and pain and insult upon themselves. And there are people that go out through the week and they sow their wild oats, and they come to church on Sunday, and they pray for crop failure. But I want you to understand, be not deceived whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we suffer because of our natural birth. We suffer because of things that we bring upon ourselves. But then here's the thing today. I want you to understand, sometimes it is God's will that suffering comes into the life of the Christian. Now, we don't understand all of that, but it's in the Bible, so we trust God uh, uh, with this wisdom that He's trying to hand to us. Notice, if you will, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Look at verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happier ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. Verse 16. I just read it. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. Sometimes suffering comes into our lives because... We are Christians. Now let me say that again, because I'm going to spend a little time here. Sometimes suffering comes into our lives simply because we're Christians. You say, preacher, man, I have really, as a Christian, I have really been suffering lately. I have got the worst ingrown toenail anybody could have ever had. I am really suffering. That's not the kind of suffering he's talking about. You say, I have been suffering lately. I've got this big wart on the end of my nose. That wart's giving me so much pain, I can't hardly live. That's not what he's talking about. Not what he's talking about. Billy Sunday tells the story of a man that went to the doctor and had a mole on his face. And uh, he wrote back to the doctor six months after taking the medicine the doctor gave him. And the letter said something like this, Doctor, I came to you with a mole on my fa face. You gave me medicine after taking your medicine for six months. My face is gone, but the wart's still there. And I want you to understand, people use all kinds of excuses for suffering. I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm suffering because I married the wrong man. Or I'm suffering because I'm hooked up with the wrong woman. Well, that gets back to the previous point. Sometimes we suffer because of what we bring on ourselves. Just remember, nobody put a gun to your head and said, I do. I know some of you are saying, now I wish somebody put a gun to my head and said, you shouldn't. But notice, if you will, it is, in these passages of Scripture, Christian suffering. Now listen closely. It is a false doctrine. It is a bad theology. It is false preaching. When you hear somebody say that Christians are not supposed to suffer. You can turn your 
television set on, and you can see those people on the Silver and Gold Network that, event that eventually will tell you and try to convince you that if you are suffering as a Christian, uh, <clears throat> that you're out of the will of God. Then the Apostle Paul must have been out of the will of God because he suffered on numerous occasions. Look in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Here's the verse that some of our friends love to read and quote, 1 Peter 2, 24, "...who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed." Now there's a religious movement today that takes that verse of Scripture and they says, you've been healed of your sickness. Therefore... You should never have a diseased gallbladder. Therefore, you should never have a ruptured appendix. Therefore, you should never have rheumatoid arthritis. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ took the stripes for your physical healing. May I remind you today, that is not what that verse of Scripture is talking about. May I remind you today, the Bible declares that everybody that, uh, that is saved has been saved from a spiritual sickness. We are dead in trespasses and, sick, and, and sins. And the Bible in the Old Testament says that we are sick from the very bottom of our feet to the very top of our head. We are spiritually sick. And when the Bible said, by His stripes you are healed, it is not talking about physical healing. It is talking about spiritual healing. We have been spiritually healed from the sickness of sin. You must understand that. You say, do you mean then God doesn't touch and God doesn't heal? Oh, yes, He does. But, but he, he doesn't have to get in the Colosseum where you pass the collection plate around and, and get a big crowd uh, and get people to throw away their wheelchairs, so-called, only to get back in their wheelchairs a little later. Uh, what I'm trying to get you to understand is, God, hey, I wouldn't go to the hospital and pray for people if I didn't believe God can touch and God can heal. And I've watched Him through the year do that. I prayed for people and they, they, they were healed. I prayed for people and they got better. And so have you. I believe that God can do that. But ladies and gentlemen, and listen to this. There's a religious group today that will disagree with my next statement. Sometimes God gets more glory out of sickness than He does out of healing. Now, the Bible bears that out. You see, a lot of people have got the idea, I want the honey, but I don't want the bees. I want the roses, but I don't want the thorns. Yeah, and we try to stay clear of that, but listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. This is Jesus speaking. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil falsely against you for my sake. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 12. Listen to this closely. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now look, folks, I want you to listen to that verse of Scripture. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said that all that live godly in Christ Jesus not might suffer, but shall suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. If you've been saved any length of time, you've suffered. But the key to this verse of Scripture is those that live godly in Christ Jesus. The more godly you live, the closer you live to Christ, the more you resemble the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater the persecution in your life. And the truth is, if there's very little persecution as a Christian, then there may be very little dedicated living to the person of Jesus Christ. Because all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I know what it is to be lied about, and you do too. I know what it is to be have my words twisted, and so do you. I know what it is to be misrepresented. I know what it is to be put down, and so do you if you've been saved any length of time. But I want to tell you, folks, there's only one way. There's only one reason why anyone would not be suffering for the cause of Christ. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you. The older I get and the more I see what's going on in our country, the more this becomes a reality. There's only one reason why anybody today that names the name of Jesus Christ would not be 
suffering for the cause of Christ. And that would be because they're not living a godly life. Because if you live a godly life, you are going to be tempted by others to do wrong. And if you live a godly life, there are going to be those on the other hand that will make fun of you for doing right. Look at 1 Peter 4.4. 4. Very interesting verse of Scripture. Let's back up for just a minute. 1 Peter 4.2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Talking about people that are saved. Verse number 3, for the time past. Now look at this. There was a time in our life when we lived according to the world. Time past. Watch that. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, and those words are like banqueting means drunken parties and drunken orgies. Uh, when people, it was used of a group of drunken people marching down the street having a drunken party. That was the past life. Now, verse number four, notice what he said. Wherein they think it strange that you, that you run not with them to the same excess of right. They even speak evil of you. What's he saying? Here's a group of people that now have trusted Christ as their Savior, and they're no longer drinking out of the same cisterns of the world. They're no longer hanging with the same crowd. Their lives have been changed and revolutionized by coming to know Christ as their Savior, and they don't go to those drinking parties. They don't go out there to the world any longer because they've been saved. And now in verse number 4, he said, They think you're strange because you don't go with them, and they even speak evil of you in verse Verse number four, why do they persecute them? Because they are different than the crowd they used to run with. And if a person is not different and they're not receiving persecution from the world, it is only because they're like the crowd still that they're running with. The Bible is very clear on that. You can't miss it. Notice First Peter again, chapter 4, verse 4. They think it's strange. That you run not with them to the same sense of variety. Now, I want you to notice something here. Very interesting, verse number 14 of chapter 4. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. It's a very interesting word. It means prosperous. Spiritually prosperous. Do you know that God considers you a spiritually prosperous Christian if you're being persecuted for the cause of Christ? Do you know that God looks at you as being rich if you're being persecuted for the cause of Christ? This lost world is not going to reproach a carnal Christian. I'll say it again. This lost world is not going to reproach a carnal Christian. Why? Because the world feels comfortable around a carnal Christian. The world feels comfortable around somebody that still that tells the same dirty stories. The world feels comfortable around someone that's still drinking out of the same cisterns. As a matter of fact, the world is glad to have a carnal Christian around them. Then they can use the carnal Christian as an excuse for living the way they live. You're spiritually wealthy, and you're living close to the Lord, the world's going to cause you some problems. When you refuse to look at the Playboy magazine that they bring out on the job, when as a Christian you refuse to compromise your convictions, then the world is going to look at you strange, and they're going to treat you strange. Let me tell you, we have out here in law enforcement, FBI's most wanted list. They have the man right at the top of the list, number one. Do you know God has a list also, and He tells us who's at the top of that list? Turn back in your Bibles for just a moment to the book of James. This is very interesting. The book of James, chapter number 4, and verse number 4. James 4.4, 4, listen to what the Bible says. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, 
Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Now, let me explain something here. When he's using the phrase adulterers and adulteresses, he's not talking about a man and a woman in an illicit relationship. When he uses that phrase there, he is talking about those that name the name of Jesus Christ and they say, yes, I'm saved. But they get more fellowship in the world than they do in the family of God. They are living in the world more than they're living in the family of God. Notice what he says. He calls them adulterers and adulteresses. Uh, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Watch this. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Folks, you cannot miss that. The number one enemy is a person that says, I'm saved, but they are living like the world. They are enjoying the world. They are drinking with the world. They are running with the world. And therefore, they're not receiving any kind of persecution because the world is happy to have them out there. The world is glad to see them stooping down to their level. And the world is justifying their sin because they're saying, this person says he's saved. He's doing the same thing I'm doing. She's doing the same thing I'm doing. Thus, the persecution ceases. Let me tell you, when the persecution comes when you live holy and you refuse to be a part of what this world is a part of. Persecution comes to the Christian. It's in the Bible. We're a bunch of twice-born people in a world of once-born people. And they don't like us. You know why they say all manner of evil against us? Well, I want to tell you, if you don't believe what I'm about to tell you is true, just hang on. Just wait another five or six years. When we speak out against sodomy, that world out there takes us on. And they say, you're not loving. Yeah, we are loving. That's the reason we talk to you about your sin. Because it's like going to the doctor. The doctor comes in the room with a needle looks like it's about two feet long. I always say, Doc, isn't there some kind of a pill I can take instead of having this? No, you got to have this. And I've learned before he can help me, he's got to hurt me. He pops that needle in. And he says, this is going to help you. Before we can help this lost world, we have to diagnose their condition. And let me tell you, their condition is terminal. This world is dying and going to hell. And the lifestyles of this world today, when we as a church, and, and look, wait a minute, this gets back to what I said just a minute ago. One of the problems is today the Bible is against sodomy. But the religious world today is accepting it as natural. We've even got bishops up north heading up churches that are avowed homosexuals. And the Bible speaks against it. And so when we speak out against it, first thing they say is, you're not loving. You're not caring. Yeah, we are. We're trying to keep you out of hell. We're trying to tell you that that lifestyle is a lifestyle that's consumer with a lost person. That God had an urban renewal program for Sodom and Gomorrah that had a lifestyle like that. When we speak out against the things of this world and, and we talk about, for instance, we talk about abortion and we say abortion is murder and abortion's wrong, the world begins to put the pressure on us. But when we say it's okay, then they don't bother us. Bill Clinton was president. I'm not getting into politics. I'm just stating a fact. When he was president, of course, he signed papers that our own, the ladies in our armed forces uh, uh, could have federal funded abortions. Uh, thank God when Bush, uh, President Bush came on board, he signed papers that stopped that. Uh, but I heard him say on a news interview one day, he said, why do you believe this? He said, well, I've talked to my pastor about it, and my pastor doesn't see anything wrong with abortion. Then your pastor is wrong, uh, and the pastor probably needs to get saved. As long as you speak out 
against abortion, as long as you speak, speak out against perverted lifestyles, uh, there's going to be some persecution. But if you go along to go along, you go along to get along, uh, you won't have any persecution. It is the closer you get to the Lord and the more holy that you live that this world and much of the religious world that's probably lost will begin to persecute the Christian. And the amount of our persecution is dependent upon our consecration to the person of Jesus Christ. The closer we get to Him, the more this lost world will show disrespect for you. You can find out pretty soon how much the world loves you or the way they treat you. Hello? Don't let me come down there and have to look back up here and say amen now. I'm in the book. I'm preaching the truth. Now, why does persecution, why does God allow it to come? Let me give you just one, and I'm going to give the invitation. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. I want you to notice when he uses the phrase, fire trial. That is a phrase that was used of a smeltering furnace. Here's a man that takes ore, he takes silver, he takes gold, and he puts it in a smeltering furnace. And as the heat begins to rise in that furnace, the impurities of that gold or that silver find their way to the surface. The impurities rise to the surface. And then the, then the individual takes a, something like a dipper and he dips off of the top of that gold, those infirmities. The impurities rise to the top. It is the heat that gets rid of the impurities. Now he said here, there are fiery trials in the life of the believer. What is God doing when He allows these things to come into our lives? The same thing that the fire does to that gold and silver. God allows it to come into our lives because He's trying to refine us. God is trying to get the impurities out of our lives. God is trying to get out of our lives that which does not separate us, which does not consecrate us, which does not positionally and progressively sanctify us in the Master's work, and that in our lives, which may become a stumbling block to this lost world, God is trying to get it out of our lives so that we can say to this lost world that serving Jesus is real. I shall never forget, several years ago, walking into a hospital room where I had been called, To a dear friend, a dear friend, a friend who had been actively involved in the work of the Lord, but whose lifestyle in the last couple years had been detrimental to the cause of Christ by the thing that he was doing. And I love this man with all of my heart and soul, dear friend of mine. I was called to the hospital, and I shall never forget when I walked in the hospital and before I ever got to the man's bed, as I came through the door walking towards his bed, he turned his head and looked at me, and he reached out with his hand to shake my hand. And he said, Pastor, I'm here because God has got my attention. I'm here today because I haven't been doing right. And it is God today that has got my attention. Sometimes in the life of the believer, God has to put us on our back. Sometimes in the life of the believer, God has to do something 
in our lives to get our attention. But let me tell you something. The Bible said if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. If we'll be honest with God, when the Spirit of God pricks our hearts and we say, Lord, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this, I repent of this. If we'll judge it, the good news is God won't have to judge it. But let me tell you, if you belong to the Lord today and you're not receiving any persecution because you're so close to this world that this world's not going to give you any grief over your lifestyle and you're saved, let me remind you that on the authority of the Word of God, it is just a matter of time until God starts the refining process in your life. Purification. I can tell you from experience it's a lot better when we acknowledge it and get rid of it than it is when God has to put us in a position where we acknowledge it to get our lives purified. Well, I could stand here and tell you story after story of people down through the years that said, Preacher, I'm where I am today because I got out of fellowship with God. Preacher, I paid this price because I, I disobeyed God. I got out of fellowship. I got out of church. I got out of my Bible. I got off of my knees, preacher. And God's had to give me this wake-up call. Purification. Sometimes suffering comes into our lives because it's the natural thing, because we live on planet Earth. Sometimes it comes into our life because we go out and do stupid things. Sometimes it comes into our life because God is saying, enough is enough now. You have blasphemed my name, and you have blasphemed my program, and you have gone astray from my will. Enough is enough. And God throws us in to the refining fires to refine us, to get that dross out of our lives so that we once again may be living epistles known and read of men. God help us today. There's so little persecution today. You know what God has done down through the the centuries of time? Watch this closely and I'm finished. Biblical history and secular history records the fact that when Christians get comfortable, no longer dedicated and no longer thankful for what for the blessings of God. God sends the nation and the people into the refining fires. We've had it so good so long in this country, and God's been so good to us. But now we have apostatized, and as a nation, we have sown to the wind, and we're reaping the whirlwind. As a nation today, we wonder why all of the fires, and why it seems like a whole state's going to be burned off of the mouth, and why certain parts of our country's got drought, and they don't know what they're going to do in the future, and other parts have got severe storms and tornadoes, and and uh, and then we're beginning to go into a recession and financial reversal, and people say, "What's going on? This nation is in the smelting furnace." Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Whether it be our nation, whether it be our churches, or whether it be our homes, or whether it be us individually, if we're saved, we cannot escape the fact that if we are not living for God, that we are heading for the smelting furnace. That God may purify our lives. That we may once again be ambassadors for the cause of Christ in a lost world that's going to hell. God help us today. May God's Holy Spirit speak to us at the close of this service. And if there is something in our lives today that is not reflecting that precious, wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, may God help us today to get it removed. May God help us today to be examples, living epistles, known and read of men, that they may see Jesus through our lives. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. The invitation goes like this. Yes, preacher, 
God sent me here today to hear this, and I've heard it. And if it was for no one else, I want God to know that I got the message. It was certainly for me. The Spirit of God spoke to me. Pastor, as you pray today, I want you to remember me because God spoke to me. Would you slip your hands up in the building and say to God, I got the message. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I pray for these today. I do not know how you have chosen to speak to their hearts. All I know is, by the upraised hand, many, many people in this building is signifying that they got the message. I ask you today, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to help people at the close of this service to make a decision. If necessary, to get out of the refiner's fire. If necessary, to prevent them from having to go there. Whatever needs to be done, and whoever, whomever's life needs to be touched, please, I pray, speak to hearts. And help us to be willing to bear the sufferings and the reproach gladly that comes through and by knowing you as our personal Savior. Help us to be different. Help us to be changed. Help us to represent you well. Should there be those here today not saved, Lord, please help them to come and get saved. Touch our hearts during these moments of invitation. I pray and do what the Spirit of God would lead us to do. Help us not to be hard-hearted or stiff-necked. But help us to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask in a moment that we stand with our heads bowed or eyes closed. I want to ask you to do this. As you stand at the Spirit of God speaking to you about anything, I want you to keep coming. I believe God sent me here today to preach this message as much as I stand in this pulpit. I believe the Spirit of God has been speaking to hearts today. And right now as we stand, there's others that need to come. Make your way on down here right now while we stand together. We're going to sing a stanza of invitation. And while the Spirit of God is speaking, I want to ask you to come on down here. You mind the Spirit of God. You do what the Holy Spirit of God would lead you to do. That's all that matters. That's all we're asking you to do. That's all God would ask you to do. You just do what the Spirit of God would lead you to do. Suffering comes many times because God is trying to put us in the furnace to get the impurities out of our lives. Others need to come. We sing this stanza of invitation. Would you make your way down here?